Please welcome Dominique Vazenovska, who will introduce tonight's film, The Forgotten Policy. I'd um, very much like to introduce um, a film that we're going to show tonight called The Forgotten Odyssey, which was made in 2000. It's a courageous and seminal piece of work in that it documents or documented for the first time this chapter of history. It was eight years in the making, and the reason that it took so long to make was because nobody was interested in telling the story. When they approached funders, the National Machines from Yakinarite, the father said, no one wants to hear this story, nobody's interested. I was born in 1960, and I grew up with war documentaries, and I studied Russian history at school, but there was no mention of this chapter of history when I was growing up. My father, who was a survivor, did mention it occasionally, and there are fragments of information that we got at the dinner table, such as the freezing cold in Siberia, the starvation, his deadly seriousness around food and finishing the dinner. There are other clues around what happened that I was later able to piece together. My father's missing teeth, which I later found out were as a result of scurvy. My missing grandfather, um, who I found out later was a result of um, having been arrested by the NKVT and he's never missing again. There's a big scar on my grandma's face from being in the camp, so I assume from a boil or something as a result of scurvy. And her picking through our rubbish bins every week to see whether there was something that she could find that she could eat or use in her house. It was only about 10 years ago that I was able to start putting the pieces together when I started talking to my great auntie who at that time was still alive and living in Poland and she thought that they had the freedom to speak for the first time about what had happened. However, this story, the story of 1.7 million Poles who were deported, is still largely untold and still largely unknown. This particular piece of work led to the creation of the Chrissy Siberia Group, which is dedicated to the legacy that the Metanishians from Yagna Wright left. Sadly, Yagna and Anera are no longer with us, but they left behind for us a fantastic legacy for our group to build upon. And what we want to do as a group is to tell this story. We're also keen to find survivors and to interview them about their experiences. It's not by accident that we don't know about this chapter of history. The saviors were very good at making sure that they picked the most remote locations with the most extreme weather conditions. You have the high attrition rate in the camps. In some places, it was up to 85% mortality rate if you managed to survive beyond a year. Um, we also have the political situation and the lack of photographic evidence. And towards the end of the terror, we have the NKBG imprisoning its own guard so that they couldn't tell what happened. Um, I just wanted to read a little, a little quote from, um, from a book here about the importance of documentary evidence. One significant difference about this experience was the lack of photographic evidence ever to emerge from the Gulag, nor was it accidental since photography within the lives of the Union, let alone the camps, was always one of the most heavily prescribed activities, guaranteed to lead to a swift arrest unless overseen by the NKVD. And without photographic evidence of their victims, the essential inhumanity of the Soviet camps never fully entered into the Western public, Western public consciousness, where such issues were open to judgment. Later, the written evidence from the survivors might be understood intellectually, and the drawings and sketches from memory acknowledged. But as it was undoubtedly true in Nuremberg, it was only the photographic evidence which elicited true comprehension from all parties, irrespective of their politics. We trust, it seems, only with our eyes. I hope that when you watch this documentary, you listen to the first-hand accounts of those who survived, and we would encourage others to do so. Stephen, Stephen has a PhD in Soviet economic history and teaches at the University of Melbourne in School of Historical and Philosophical Studies. Sophie Scarbeck, please come up. Sophie is the president of the Siberia Association of Victoria. Stefan Wisniewski. Stefan is the president of the Federal Siberia Foundation. And Priscilla Kings. Priscilla 
parents were transported to the Alden camps in Yakutsk, USSR. Now, after the panel discussion ends, there will be a short questions and answers segment. And uh, hopefully, we'll get some good questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, I, I think what we'll do is uh, each of the, the panel will speak for probably about three minutes or so. Uh, and then we'll follow the second one. Speak up, please. 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 Speak up, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a North Pole academic, and I uh, will be giving you a, uh, I suppose, a view of representing what the, uh, the academic uh, world has been doing with this. Uh, you've heard the accusation um, uh, that, in fact, is a forgotten policy that has been much uh, ignored in the teaching uh, and in the presentation of, uh, of, of, of these events. Um, I say I felt slightly uneasy about that, but I think this uh, Louis said at the beginning, there's uh, I think perhaps a difference between the popular knowledge and to some extent the sort of academic, academic knowledge. Uh, I, I think as was pointed out in the film, there was uh, uh, knowledge uh, amongst many groups. I must say I thought the film was absolutely tremendous in the humanity and understanding that it showed uh, how people who had suffered quite extraordinary humanities would still nevertheless be so openly you know, understanding the way at the beginning people were saying uh, well of course uh, the British didn't acknowledge it was in the middle of the war of course the big priority at the time was to win the war what else could, could be done uh, I thought that was you know, shown quite extraordinary uh, humanity and uh, understanding um, Something, in fact, I thought that Professor Norman Davis at the end was slightly missing uh, uh, in, and I think it's very important from academic points of view to work out what is acceptable in a war when the main priority is more or less to win. Uh, Church of its saying, and I'll, I'll, I'll drink soup with the devil if need be, and under those circumstances, I think we do. I, I think it to be a little bit fair to the British, I think it does have to be pointed out that when the Soviets wanted to lay the charge uh, at Nuremberg of the Catholic murders against the, uh, the Germans, uh, the British and the Americans refused to let that, that happen. Uh, so there was, this is why I think Norman Davis and they were trying to bury it forever. If they really were trying to bury it forever, you wouldn't have done that. So there was a slightly bit of principle, and I think I remember from my youth going to, in fact, Polish house in, in, in London and finding out what was happening. I can remember actually being very much amazed. I'm, I used to go to Russia uh, by, remember, by, by train and by boat. I mean, why was it that the Harwich to a book uh, boat had all the languages in Polish? Dutch uh, and English, not in German. Uh, and then it was very clear uh, I was educated in the British Netherlands, everybody knew the Polish Air Force was based in Stafford, we had less dealings with uh, obviously the, the, the other, other groups. But there was, I think, a bit of popular knowledge, and I don't think that it really was anything like as, as covered up, I think, in the historical, uh, but there was, I think, a uh, during the war, difficulties understanding what was what was what was what was going on. I I, I don't want to speak for that very long. I think I said that because it is part of the general pattern of Soviet um, uh, terror against different ethnic communities, different communities within uh, the Soviet uh, Union itself. I spoke earlier, in fact, to the Institute of Polish Affairs, arguing that in fact Polish operations in the purge. This is against Soviet. Polish uh, citizens, but against many of their ethnicities, Germans, uh, actually Koreans, and all of them, all of the border areas, anyone who could be accused of potentially doing anything, were extraordinarily severe and didn't involve ethnic cleansing. And I don't think something that 
in cultural terms within, certainly sort of ethnic and the Polish community within, within the Soviet Union could be described as, as genocide. Gen- 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 uh, and they were, I think, what we saw in the Second World War was a, a, a continuation of that same kind of, of, of mentality of war. But I, I you don't think, I mean, I'm just uh, I, I explaining the way that I, 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 from an academic point of view, I am a little bit worried about the figures that are being banded. We saw 1.7 million on the film. Uh, our distinguished president here gave the figure of 1 million. I have worked in some detail with the, the vast amount of material that now come out from joint Polish Russian uh, historians searching the archives, and they find it very difficult to come up with figures more than 600,000 for those who were, if you like, um, uh, deported uh, through the deportation channel. So I think you know, 1.7 million probably is a bit of a sort of loose description of total numbers of citizens from, the, from Poland who did move into the Soviet Union. I think there is difficulty uh, finding that those figures. But I mean, it's such an enormous uh, in, in humanity. I think the film captures it very well. But, and I think it does that by bringing it alive to some of the personal stories that come into the home and they uh, some of the work. So, so We were lucky, we got an officer. 
who seemed to be slightly human. And he said to my mother, don't worry because where you're going, you need your father, I need your husband and the children's father. We were amazed at And then he said, take as much cold, uh, warm things as you possibly can because where you're going, it's going to be very cold. So um, then, of course, we had a uh, soldier and he would be standing with a rifle. We packed as much as we could. That's my mother, my brother, who's five years old and me, lives in Perth, and my aunt was Liz Dina. And uh, our journey to the Soviet Russia started then. Can I mention that the children took the was in the same way as <laughs> <Right. laughs> We traveled together. We lived in the same hotels. So when Shushu left um, Soviet Russia a bit earlier than me, I cried. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, I don't know what, why we left earlier, because there was absolutely no one who could come and get us as a soldier's family. Until some poor <coughs> Polish soldier who was sent, Polish soldiers were sent out to basically crisscross Russia <laughs> to see if there are any families in various villages and he found us. My mother says that he was in such a state she's not sure how much further he could get. But he put us down as his family. So after the embassy we were given a little card which said, yes, we can move around Russia. But it wasn't quite that easy. We had to go to the NKVD uh, office and um, for a hearing, so to speak. And because there were four of us, my aunt was 53, so we had called her an old woman. They asked my mother, what are you going to do in the army? She said, I'm going to get a rifle. <laughs> and my brother, he was, I think he was eight then, no, ten, and he said he's going to play in the army orchestra. They somehow swallowed that. They said to my aunt, what are you going to do? And she said, I'm going to cook. And they looked at me and just went <laughs> like this and said, yes, you can go as well. So we followed all the steps that other people did from, um, North Kazakhstan to Uzbekistan to join the Polish army. My brother actually joined the army as a 10 year old boy and they gave him a drum and he played and <laughs> he did that shoot. <laughs> he did and before he actually got this great role to leave the army, he had to go through a hearing test but he wasn't dead, through a um, singing test to see that he could carry tunes necessary. He passed everything. And so he was always at the front of the Polish um, Bethlehem. Great. <laughs> and leaving the soldiers behind him. And then after Russia, we went to uh, Tehran, where we stayed for about nine months. From there, run through Akfas. Uh, we went to Karachi. In Karachi, there was a huge, very, very big camp. This is where we first met American and English soldiers. And I don't go there one time. <laughs> and I must say, they were very kind to us. They gave us as much as they possibly could. They took us children to their uh, various camps so we could perform college college and dancing in our costumes who uh, somehow or other mothers made costumes for us. Um, from then, we were taken to India by the mother 
comes back to this issue of collective uh, memory. Uh, during the war, when the Polish uh, people were uh, found themselves in the Middle East, um, the Polish citizens, who include uh, Jewish people as well, I mean, Menachem Bain was one of the people who made it up with Andy's army, and there were other notable um, there are Polish Jews as well. Not so many, but maybe six or, six or seven thousand, not many thousand of the army. Um, they were described in the press as refugees from Nazi aggression. So it wasn't actually said, hey, these are the people who were um, captured when, when Russia, in its alliance with Hitler, uh, when the Soviet Union, in its alliance with Hitler, invaded Poland, and they were working on the slave labor camps for the last two years, and now they've been released because Hitler turned on, on Stalin. It was, these are refugees from Nazi German aggression. So, and again, it's understandable during the war how the truth is, the truth is the first casualty of, of war, but, from a personal point of view, if you were a, a young Pole and were writing to your family and you were saying, well, we got out of the Soviet camps, those letters would be censored and those words would have been cut out by the British military. Uh, so there was actually active censorship going on about the story. And then you say, well, how, how, why, why after the war wasn't the story then told? So, you know, the war was over and it was defeated. The Soviets were, were the bad guys, right, from the West, so why didn't this all come out? In fact, there were congressional hearings in the U.S. on who did the tactical thing. There was the AFL CIO, uh, George Rooney, and the labor movement did studies of the blue lives and things like that. But, you know, there was nobody really to advocate on the Polish side because they were under Soviet control until 1989 for another 50 years. And you could get arrested, and in fact, many were arrested and sent to Siberia again. Uh, in Poland, we're talking about this. Um, so there was no real strong constituency. There was no nation state to speak for the Polish experience. Um, and in the West, people didn't really you know, want to hear, or some people talked about it in their experiences where they believed, what do you mean you need blacks in the Siberian country? I mean, you go back to your experience. That couldn't have happened. Um, and so maybe it's a subtle thing, and maybe it's psychological, and I'm not a psychologist or a sociologist or a doctor or anything like that. But when groups like ours arose, there was a, a tremendous feeling that the people were finally given a voice um, for the survivors and, and also those who didn't survive and whose bodies were thrown um, you know, by the wayside. My grandfather died in uh, 1942 in January after being released and we don't know where his body is. He, was, he died on the train journey and uh, the film said, if you die, your body was basically thrown out of size and quite often uh, the wolves was just basically, you know, that's how the wolves um, um, found their food often was uh, the dead prisoners. Uh, you tried to bury them if the ground was so hard that they'd come back and the wolves and they dug up. So this is part of the tragedy that, that on a personal level these people have been feeling uh, and it's quite interesting maybe a different topic but the reason that this group arose and you see the three R words that research remember and recognize is that those were the gaps that were felt. That felt well, we don't really have information on this. It's not in the history books. Um, some historians, of course, would know about it, but it's not popularly uh, known that this happened. The remembrance, uh, the stories of the people like we've heard in the film and Zosha and others, you know, in the audience and all around the world and in all these countries never really got recorded and part of our project was to do that and finally to give them the recognition um, just that they didn't go through this uh, they lost their homes they lost their childhoods they lost their, their country in fact many of them died from Poland and became free in the end um, and so they carried a little bit of Poland everywhere that they went and I was a bit of a product of that child of these um, you know, little artificial uh, Polands that were carried around because the real Poland was still under foreign domination. Uh, maybe I'll just make one last sort of comment, which I think Stephen's quite right about the figures. Uh, we don't really know how many people were finally deported. And the other thing is about statistics. Um, statistics often have, well, they always have to be defined. Um, and so when you throw a number out, you actually have to have a lot of caveats. This number includes these people, not that people. I think that the number of somewhere between one or two million is actually the Polish citizens of all nationalities that found themselves in captivity in the USSR and then became released by the Tamers because the Polish government has set up delegations to how we help these people. Many were orphans, um, many were without the breadwinner, the 
us to you know, get into where to go and where to go. So how many people were there? Somewhere we could put in two million. How many would put in paddle cars at gunpoint? Probably that lower number, you know, half a million or some number like that. Uh, really, the debate over the numbers can fool us and divert us down the wrong paths. Really, what, what I've got to be a little bit of my mission, I'll wrap it up and pass it on to because he's going to talk about it now, has really been those three R's to, to help support research members' recognition that this this happened. Um, and importantly, it happened to people because they were Polish citizens and enemies of the Soviet state. Uh, whether they were Polish, uh, Jewish, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Armenian, as Krzysztof pointed out, they were, they were all building a kind of multinational country and trying to find a way to work together and live together between the wars for Poland, which is just a new state that had arisen after you know, hundreds of years of um, being under occupation, essentially. It was a new country, and these nationalities were trying to live together in kind of this melting pot. Uh, and so that's our philosophy as well. Um, we're, we're open, we're inclusive, and one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be here with you today is I feel it's really important for um, the Polish Jews to understand and build bridges with us and understand their side of, of the experience, they can understand our side, and we build these bridges of common understanding. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, times in those days, and uh, we're very fortunate to be here. So that's very good to hear. Thank you. Okay, um, my parents were both taken to Siberia, uh, and I only really learned the full story, the historical story, very recently. I knew my parents' story, but it was told very much in isolation. It was the story of our family survival during the war. And so I believed it was really just their own experience. I didn't really know that there were hundreds of thousands of people that were taken at that time until I started research when my father told the story to me. He was really quite old by then. Um, he's not able to tell his story to death because he died about 18 months ago. Now, my parents um, were Jewish and um, they were from Krakow. When the war broke out um, a few days after, my father and his two brothers headed for Bob. And um, they were, uh, one of them was called the Visions, the Silk Visions, they were the refugees fleeing the uh, advancing German army and heading east. It's a choice they made, they thought they'd go and use it was safer in my Indian adventure, the advancing army. My mother followed uh, a couple of months later, by that time, Paul was already taken over by the Russians. She um, had to swim the river, cross the border to get into Russia. Now, some people here in the audience would have known my mother, she was a very nervous, very respected person, and for her to have done that was quite a feat. Um, they settled and they married in Bob and they um, worked there until the night of the 30th of June 1940 when um, the, they, the Russians came for them and the reason my parents gave me was that they didn't have papers to stay in Bob. Uh, they were refugees. My father's brother had married someone who lived in Bob. He was allowed to stay. Another brother had moved to China Hall, um, and others were hiding on their own papers. So they were taken in, in that transport at the railway station. My mother's brother was there as well. His papers hadn't been of much use. He was also transported. My parents went to the Aldan camps in the Arctic province, which is right in the Tiger Forest on the Arctic Circle. I see some people nodding to perhaps we were in the same transport. It's, it's interesting that, that there are people here who have had some experience yet we haven't talked about it and, and they haven't met. Um, my parents didn't meet me, but we haven't met my parents. Um, I've got a, a little bit of a first-hand account of some of their experiences and I might just read you a, a little bit here. My father saw it very differently to my mother, by the way. She saw it very negatively, more positive. Um, 
that they would take up Russian citizenship. Um, and that could be why they weren't repatriated back to Poland until 1946. Now, um, the, uh, for them, their experience of Russia, see Russia and the Siberian camps in retrospect and in context of what they learned later, of what had been going on in Poland, what had happened to their families, they saw their deportation as a blessing in some ways. The two brothers, my father's brothers, had stayed in the uh, One was shot in the Tinsky woods, uh, when the um, Germans came up over to, when they crossed over into the eastern part of Poland, their preferred method was mass execution, and pulled it to the head in a mass grave. And I think that's a, that's a story that's also coming out now and being told about the treatment of the Jews once the Germans invaded that part of Poland. Um, the other brother was um, taken to my house, got off in perishing there towards the end of the war. Um, one of my mother's sisters involved was um, uh, betrayed, she was in hiding, she was betrayed. She, I think, I think she perished now, she was in the end. Um, uh, and, and my and the brother had also been to Russia, he went to the Kuba plant, he never heard from him again, so my mother assumed that he, he had survived. And if he had survived, he would have tried to return and, and find his family. Uh, so it, when they heard of the horrors that had befallen the family, and of my parents, my, my grandparents were executed in, in the village in, in Krakow, which is in Krakow, um, by the person they had been lucky, and at the end they had to say it's how bad, and I'm grateful for that because I'm here and I had them my parents. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'd like to just pick that one up by thanking you for uh, standing up and uh, mentioning this part of the history, which is very important. Um, the Crest of Siberia group, you'll notice, has a virtual museum at the website. We've divided it up to 25 different chapters of this whole odyssey. One of these halls or chapters of the odyssey is actually about exactly what you mentioned. It's the Battle of Ladino and uh, it's the Polish division uh, under uh, General Berlin. Um, I think that what's happened in the past, to just quickly put into the context for you, and I hope you agree, is um, there was a real division between the, um, the, the Polish people, I suppose, who ended up in Poland and those who ended up in the West. Communication was constrained. In fact, if people in the West were writing or communicating with people inside Poland, the Polish people would be suspected of being spies for the West and so on. The, the communication was actually cut off by the Iron Curtain. Um, and what that meant is for many years, people in the West didn't really know that much about what the Poles went through under communists and, you know, in the, who went out to Russia. The only way they could, they couldn't join Andrew's army anymore, they got cut off, so they went out with, uh, you know, fighting Hitler under the, under the Soviets. Similarly, people in Poland didn't really know the experience of people who had, you know, no homeland to go to, and maybe sometimes they thought as well. That's great. These guys are out in the West living the life of Riley. And the streets are paved with gold. Why don't they come back to Poland and help us rebuild the country? So there was real kind of schism, which only after you know, 1989 this started to, to dissolve. And in fact, our headquarters is in Warsaw for that very reason, uh, is we're trying to build the bridge back with the generations. Sometimes one brother was in Berlin's army, one was in Andrew's army, another one was in the Battle of Britain flying with the British Air Force. Um, and you know, other ones were in Africa and refugee camps. And there were also those who never made it out of the Soviet Union and are still, the descendants are still there now, um, hanging on a little bit to their Polish culture and have never been able to return to the homeland. For us, it's important that all of these stories are shared. Thank you. Uh, have any questions? Ma, my yes. is, uh, the more than the more than for you. Ah, yeah, and 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 see, we want to do this. We have to have some organization. There we go. What we And Yes. 
some of these people that were uh, went to Russia were uh, refugees from Germany. It is true. I was four years old when the war started, and we were refugees from Warsaw. My father found himself in the Yavistov, which was taken by Russians, and we were illegal refugees to the border between Germany and Russia. And if it wasn't for that, that we went to Russia, I wouldn't be here because I have all the family, nobody survived. They're all fish in the Vika. So let's not forget that. That unintentionally perhaps, but the Russians decided a lot of foreign Jews. No, thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I Ethnic groups who were Polish ethnic as um, 
being truly Polish to be allowed to go. So if you were Ukrainian, you had to pretend you were Polish to get out of the army. If you were Jewish, you had to be given a crucifix and smuggle your way on, which often some of the Polish people gave, you know, somebody's telling the story at the end of the day. But your question was about politics. Um, in Andrew's book, he writes that he had to issue directives that there was to be no discrimination. Um, people who made the Hinina was forced to do that. Was there some anti-Semitism? Yes, there was some anti-Semitism. But the official policy was not that. Um, and we, we had Jewish soldiers, so we must have got in. Um, we had Jewish chaplains in the army, so they must have been there. Um, what actually happened on a day-to-day basis is human nature and human attitudes, but that's not politics, that's behavior. And I run a group of online group also of descendants of the Polish squadrons. And surprise, surprise, we've got at least six descendants of Jewish Polish airmen. And all of them were came through Siberia. And so there was an acceptance of it. But I have also read that there was an active um, wedge politics policy by the Soviets in how they treated sort of the Polish minorities in sort of recruitment into the army, who they allowed, who didn't. Because when somebody was recruited, they had to go through kind of a, a panel. Uh, I also know that one of the city ducks here in Melbourne, I just recently interviewed her, she, her husband was um, a Polish Jew who was also a dentist in the Polish uh, sort of camps in, in India. So it's Somebody says to me that you know, it was one exception at all into the Polish Armed Forces. There are too many exceptions to the rule to basically support the fact because I know personally of these three in the UK, seven Polish airmen. Actually, one of them was also here in Melbourne, Polish airmen. Sorry? Yes. Um, um, I would just say, just to clarify, and also a couple of candidates as well. So. This, will keep, this is the last question. Mm-hmm. Yes. This is just a very quick comment about what Zina said. Um, I'm from the Polish Museum outside in Australia. My father was in the tanks in the first Polish army. The whole war, he was in the same tank with a Jewish gentleman who ended up a general in the Seven Day War. Uh, but I think when we talk about it, we have to uh, 